uh, tonight. Oh, I can't. That's the problem. I can't turn it up. If there's a way, I would. Talk louder then. Or you can move down, too. This ain't church. Is that better? That's better. So anyway, thanks again for, for attending uh, tonight's meeting. A couple of administrative things. Uh, there's a sign-in sheet over here. If you didn't sign in, please, please do. It just gives us a, a count of, of who's here tonight. And there's there's room there too for you to put an email address and the other contact info in case you want to uh, receive any information from us about this project or, or any other projects. You know, back in 2014, the, uh, the court held a public hearing regarding the Grand Tower Phase Visor project. And tonight we're going to follow up with you on uh, the results of, of the, uh, the study. And contrary to what you may have seen or read out there, this won't be long-winded, it won't be technical. Uh, if anything, it will be short, and it's going to be a, a, a level everyone can understand. We don't, you know, we're not here to try and trick you or, or fool you or, or get over on you, as they would say. We're here to present the facts. That's all we're going to do tonight is present the facts as uh, what the science has told us about this, uh, this project. So, uh, it will be short, it won't be long-winded, won't be technical, be not technical. And uh, if you have any questions, hold them until after the presentation. If you want to run through the presentation, because what we found is a lot of questions get answered during the presentation. And actually, there will be questions after. But hold the questions until after, so we get through the presentation, and then we'll, we'll turn around and, uh, and take the questions there. So, at this time, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Mike Rogers. He's the, uh, the program manager for this project. He's going to explain all this to you. Hey, your name. So, uh, so what's the value? I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Mike Rogers. Let me introduce myself. Just got a little ahead of myself. I'm, I'm the project manager for this project. It's a regulating works project. It's about 200 river miles from the confluence of the Missouri River to the confluence of the Ohio River, uh, Open River. So that means we don't have any locks and dams. So uh, and I'll get that into, uh, into my brief a little bit. But uh, but we certainly appreciate the opportunity to come here and re-engage with you after a two-year uh, delay. Um, so once again, so my, my objectives are to provide a status update. Sorry. Provide a status update and address any questions. So basically, this is a, a layout of, of our uh, river reach. Once again, uh, this is the confluence of Missouri all the way up to the confluence of the Ohio. So our authorization requires us to ma maintain a nine foot deep, 300 foot wide channel through this reach. We do, and once again, we don't have locks and dams. So there's two ways we do that. We do that with repetitive dredging, so mechanical dredging, an actual dredge going out there, uh, removing a sediment, displacing it to the side, and we use river training structures. So, and the benefit is, is we typically, on an annual basis, have 110 million tons of commodities going through the middle Mississippi River. That's river mile zero to 200. So, on average, we save our transporters $3 billion a year transporting on the river versus other means of transportation. Uh, once again, this, I just wanted to highlight the benefits. So 115 barge tow, when I say 115 barge tow, so there's 15 barges per tow. Typically, we have 25 barges per tow within this reach. 115 barge tow is equivalent to over 1,050 semi-trucks. So waterborne transportation is the most efficient, environmental-friendly form of transportation. So we talk, we know a lot about greenhouse gases and how they impact the environment. It's not only the most efficient, it's mostly environmental friendly as, you know, comparing river navigation to rail or trucks reduces uh, our CO2 out by 30% when you compare it about to, uh, to rail and over a thousand percent when you uh, compare it to trucks. So. Uh, once again, this is, uh, this gives you an outline of the 
the uh, Middle Mississippi River. Once again, the pool section is where we have lots of dams. That's where we have 300 to 195. So we don't construct a lot of river training structures up there. We do a lot of O&M, which is operation and maintenance on the existing structures. So we kind of retrofit them, restore them when they're damaged. But the lower 200 river miles, 195 to zero, that's where we really focus our energy and construct river training structures. Uh, just to give you an idea, I don't know if everyone's been able to go up to, this is Lock and Dam 24 in Clarksville. So we've got four locks in our system upstream of St. Louis. And lock and Dam 24 is one of them. But down here, we don't have any locks and dams. So we have to maintain it once again with a mechanical dredge or by using river train structures. These are Benway weirs. And Benway weirs are angled upstream, so it flows actually this direction down, you know, going down the sheet. Uh, they're angled upstream and what they do is they take all the energy from the outside of the bend and they stick it to the center of, of the channel. So they re redirect the flow. Dikes on the other hand, they constrict the channel and deepen it. So uh, this is a W dike, this is really a unique structure downstream here near, near uh, River Mile 5, near the confluence of the Ohio River. Uh, so, so we try to create unique shapes to maintain and enhance ecological diversity. We're required to avoid and minimize the impact to the environment for our project. And what's, what we do and why we're coming up with these new structures, these estadikes and these divertidikes, are because our outside agencies, our partners, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Missouri Department of Conservation, and Illinois Department of Natural Resources, tells us they don't want typical dikes. They want something new to enhance the environment, to maintain the ecological diversity. So that's what we do. We come up with solutions that are win-win, win for navigation, and a win for the environment. So that's the, that's the reason we got all these kind of crazy shapes out there, is because those crazy shapes, they create habitat for fish. Uh, so specifically, I wanted to talk about Grand Tower Phase 5. When I talk about Grand Tower, it's basically what we, we just have a river mile reach, about a 20, 25 mile river reach. We just break the, seg the river reaches up into segments, and we just title them. For, for instance, this river reach we consider Grand Tower. So we've had, this is our fifth project within the Grand Tower reach, so that's why we call it Grand Tower Phase 5. Uh, particularly, what, what the issue is here is we have a repetitive dredge issue. Since, since 2000, we've spent over $11 million repetitively dredging that, that channel. So we have to artificially maintain this. Rather than coming up with a sustainable solution using river training structures, we've had to artificially maintain it. Um, 2010 and 2015, we spent $4.2 million. So once again, it keeps on getting more and more expensive for us to maintain this channel. We're, once again, we're authorized by Congress to maintain that channel. So it's basically law saying that you have to have this channel 300 foot wide, 90 feet deep year round. Uh, and most recently, even with the, the high water of 2015, we spent over $700,000 directing this location. So it's a repetitive problem. We've analyzed it for over 15 years, and now we, we need to address it. So when we address it, we, we came up with the hydraulic sediment response model, which is a small scale physical model. We have a lab in St. Louis where we actually do this modeling, and we evaluated over 37 alternatives. And we chose alternative 33 based on not only its performance on the navigation channel, but its ecological enhancements and maintaining ec ecological diversity. So, um, as most of you know, we had a public hearing in 2014, and we discussed our path forward, and there was a lot of uh, a lot of questions that we didn't have the answers to uh, as far as numerical modeling. So then we went ahead and met, took that next step. We went ahead and spent the next two years, you know, completing a numerical model, an ADH numerical model. We'll talk about it a little bit in the next few slides to actually <coughs> verify that we're not having impact to flood heights by placing these river training structures in the sea. So that's kind of where we are today. Uh, so this was specific. Once again, um, we basically have two, two uh, construction locations. This is what we're calling upstream right around the river mile 69. We have three weirs. These weirs are below the water surface year round. You'll never see them. Uh, even at the low water stages in 2012, there would still be nine feet of uh, depth across these. So navigation will be able to cross these uh, river training structures on, on the on a year-round basis, independent of the river stages. What, what these 
structures do is water flows across them at 90 degrees. So this gray area is high energy. What we're doing is taking the energy on these weirs and actually transporting it downstream to make, make more uniform energy through this area rather than having high energy here and relatively low energy downstream. So we want to capture that energy and make the river work for us downstream to address the river competitive dredge location. Um, once again, our construction, it's all going to be river based, so it's going to be barges on the river, and we use limestone primarily, 5,000 pound uh, top size, all the way down to fine particles. Um, and I think this is the area where most of you are concerned about these S dikes, these new dikes that, that we're constructing. Uh, so we, the whole purpose of these X, S dikes is to address these, these, this green area is, is the repetitive dredge location that I mentioned. So once again, over the last 15 years, we spent over $10 million uh, dredging at this location. Uh, and we're, we're using these S dikes to create a secondary channel on the back side of this. We are removing structures. We're removing these two structures, are shortening them to allow flow to come through on the back side of this. So not only will we maintain navigation depths through here, and sustainable, you know, throughout the years to come. We're also creating a secondary channel on the back side of that to create habitat. And once again, these structures were recommended to us by our environmental partners in collaborating with them, you know, them uh, while we're doing our model. And my next slide, is a, this is what this is typical construction we'll use. This is a, a drag line off the bar. This is the material I'm talking about, limestone. Uh, it's pretty common material here in the quarries, uh, about 25,000 PSI, hard, hard limestone, large sizes all the way down to small sizes. Uh, so our intent is to award this contract in 2016 and then start construction in uh, August of 2016 and then start construction most likely in September of 2016. Uh, and it'll likely be phased construction, uh, you know, depending on funding. That's all I have. Uh, this is Eddie Brower. Thanks, Mike. My name is Eddie Brower. I'm a hydraulic engineer with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. This is, uh, this is a topic that I've spent a lot of time researching, working with a number of scientists from academia, from other agencies, on evaluating. And I wanted to give some perspective into some of the history of, um, of some of the research that looks at the impact of river training structure construction on, on water surfaces, but specifically at, at floods. But first I want to talk about just a real basic description of, of how these structures work, what the purpose is, and, and why we build them. So here's a cross section of a river, say, before we put structures. We've got a wider river, and you can see where there's no structure. So we put the structure in. And the purpose of that structure is to speed up velocities. And once those velocities speed up, we get additional depth. Once we get that additional depth, it, it increases the cross-sectional area. The velocities will, will decrease back to around where they were before. And that will give us a narrower but much deeper channel. That is what, what we're trying to gain so we don't have to dredge and spend over and over the annual expenditures that Mike was talking about. This, we've done a number of studies looking at um, historical surveys, looking at areas where we've constructed structures using multi-beam, single beam, all the technology that we have available to evaluate what is the cross-section look like before and after. And what we've seen in these studies is that the cross-section remains relatively constant and the conveyance remains, remains constant. And what does that mean for us and in lay terms is it shows that the capacity to move water after we build these structures is is the same as it was before we put them in. Oh, and this slide here just kind of gives you an idea of where these structures are. If you drive by the river when there's low water, they look like they're sticking quite a bit out of the river. At most, most regular flows, average flows, they're submerged, and then at high waters, it, it floods when the water's up on the levees, when the water's like it was just a few months ago. We, these are submerged by up to 35 feet. So there's quite a bit of, quite a bit of water over these structures. Here's a, just a cross-section, this is a random cross-section we took just to give you a perspective of the structures and the floodplain and how everything, how everything goes together. And this is the blue line there is what we're going to look at a little closer. So you can see here, this is, on the top is a distorted view, and the bottom is my attempt to show an view. So you can see 
that the structure is well below bank full, that it's well below the grade of the levy, the grade of your, your top bank. Now, the, the questions of do these structures have an impact on flood levels is something that the Corps and other agencies and other scientists and academia have looked at for many, many years. This dates back all the way to 1933 is when we started to have some of our first in-depth studies looking at, um, at what's happened to the floodway capacity of the river and dating all the way into that. There was a lot of, a lot of research done in the 70s and the 80s. There was much that was, that was done in the early 2000s and then I'll get to some of the more recent stuff. So there's a, there's a history and a body of literature that looks at these, looks at this exact topic, and a, lot, a majority of all the research has come to the conclusion that these do not impact flood stages, that the construction of these river training structures impact flood stages. Now, there are, as you know, there are some people that are critical of the core and, and what we're constructing, and these are, and we look at these in depth, and if you look at the EA, which is where, what triggered us coming to the first meeting, having the public hearing, was the EA, the Environmental Assessment for, for the Scram Tower project. But if you um, are curious about the, some of the, the reports that are critical of what we've done, you can read the Appendix A, and it goes into depth on why, why we don't, don't agree with that, why we don't agree with our conclusions, and it also talks about all the research out there that helped us, that helped support our conclusions. So it's all there, it's a, it's a pretty large document. So you can fully understand how we've taken each one of these reports and each one of these studies into account. And around 2008, we did a number of external independent reviews. This um, became a very big issue and some people from different universities had brought to our attention that they believed that we were having a great impact on flood risk. We took this very seriously. And so we went out to the experts in the fields. We looked at people from outside of the core and academia. We looked at experts in geomorphology and river engineering. We went to Missouri s and which is a, an engineering college in, in Rolla, Missouri. We went to the University of Iowa, which is a, has a very large and internationally renowned engineering, river engineering hydraulics department and the University of Illinois. And we had a number of new analyses done so we could go in and we could use the most up-to-date information, most up-to-date studies, most up-to-date technology to take a new look at this and all of the data that's been collected over the years to see if, if there's something, something that we're missing or to, to make sure that we know darn well when we, as we move on to construct these types of structures that we're not having an impact on, on, uh, on flood risk. And the, the conclusion of all these studies led us to, to confirm that we are not having an impact on, on, river, uh, on flood levels. So the conclusion is that the results of these analyses over the past 80 years have led the other conclusion that construction of these structures do not raise flood levels. And we, uh, the results of the external reviews also from that conclusion. And we continue to do evaluations like the one that Zach's going to talk about now, using the most up-to-date technology, the most up-to-date information to evaluate this. One of the questions that's been asked, that was asked before, that I'll just go ahead and address to save time when we get to the questions, is, well, why didn't you have, you know, I think you're going to bring Zach up here, he's going to introduce himself as a hydraulic engineer with the Corps of Engineers. Why didn't you bring this to the National, Science, the National Academy of Science and have them evaluate this? And the reason why we didn't go to them for this particular study is because that's outside the scope of what they do. They're not gonna look at one project, we can't go to them and say, hey, we wanna evaluate, uh, we would like you to do a numeric model that looks at river mile X to river mile Y. What they would do is a more programmatic, higher level of evaluation. Which leads to the second question, well, why don't you have them look at this? You've got a body of literature with the core and a body of literature with some critics that, um, that says that that doesn't agree with the core. Why don't you have them evaluate this and, and come to their conclusion? The reason we haven't done that is because we've done a number of studies. We've done, we've done a literature review of all the analysis. We've worked with experts in the field, and we don't believe it, it warrants that at this time. If somebody wanted to do it, if someone wanted to fund it outside of us, we'd be willing, like we are, with anybody that's critical of what we do or has any questions, of working with them and providing information, providing ourselves, just like with the GAO report, where we went in and we provided everything we could and answered all the questions that we could. So we're willing participants in something like that, but that's not something that we we believe this has risen to that level because we've evaluated this for over 80 plus years. And an overwhelming majority, including the experts that the GAO talked to, that, that there's no flood, flood impact. 
So, like I said, I got a little ahead of myself. The conclusion future analysis, we're continuing to look at this. And one of the things that we've done is what Zach's going to talk about, this ADH model. It's a two-dimensional model that, that looks specifically at what are these structures we're building adjacent to your levees. What do they do to the water levels, and what do, how do they impact the flood levels? Zach? Like Eddie said, I'm Zach Riles, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Hydraulic engineer. Uh, tonight I want to discuss a little bit about the 2D modeling that uh, was conducted on the proposed river train structures that I mentioned earlier. So the program we used is the Adaptive Hydraulic Tunnel System, or ADH. It was developed by the Coastal and Hydraulic Laboratory, the Engineer Research and Development Center of Vicksburg. ADH is a numeric model that evaluates several open channel flow environments such as rivers, estuaries, reservoirs, and coastal regions. ADH calculates a depth average, two-dimensional velocity, and water surface elevation. Uh, just for your reference, this is a typical piece of data that's input in the ADH model, just wanted to display that. So a little bit about the people that made the ADH model, the Engineer Research Development Center, heard it. They're the world-renowned experts in engineering and scientific research. CHL, which is Coastal Hydraulics Laboratory, part of Verdict, has a recognized leader in water resources. They've done research for over 85 years for water resources, water resources problems. Um, and they also specialize in the development and implementation of ADH. So like Eddie said earlier, that to evaluate, to properly evaluate the effects of water surface elevation on structures, you need to have a change in the So over here on my right, we have the base condition, over here on the left, we have the proposed condition. You can see that the proposed condition has this blue, which shows the channel being deep, where you have this lighter yellow here. So this is what we used for our model to represent the effect of the structures. Elevations, all the assumptions in the modeling were exactly the same, so the only comparison we would get would be the effects of the water surface elevation. So, and what we did when we ran the model, basically to stay consistent with FEMA, state, and local agencies, we used the standard regulatory discharge, the 1% annual chance of seeded flood. The 1% annual chance of seeded flood, or commonly referred to as a 100 year flood, is a 1% chance that, that discharge will be exceeded in a given year. In running the model, we found that the proposed structures had no impact on water surface elevation. Actually, you can see throughout the reach, upstream, downstream, and along the bank lines, the uh, proposed construction alternative compared to the base did not exceed 0.05 feet, which is the standard no rise by permitting agencies. And our results for our ADH model also match some of the studies that Eddie mentioned, showing or they're consistent, saying that the impact of river training structures do not affect flood levels. With that, I'm going to turn it back to Renee.